Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes. This is my webcast about Territory of Light by Yuko Tsushima. Before I begin, please take note of my outfit. I'm doing this in solidarity for the people of Ukraine. We are thinking of you and bearing witness to the atrocities that you're suffering. So the book, um, this was the February pick for Emily's Walking Book Club. It was written in the 70s by a single mother and also by the daughter of a single mother um, in Japan, it's set in Tokyo. It was first published as 12 short stories that were um, published sort of one by one over the course of a year. And the short stories follow you know, a year in the life of a single mother with a young child. Um, in our discussion on Hampstead Heath and also on Zoom, well, this, the book had some real fans. There were also a few people who were quite lukewarm. And I'd say overall, our general feeling about the book was, you know, maybe a six or seven out of 10, if you were to take the, the, the sort of temperature of the whole group. Um, I, I have to say, by the end of the walk, we've gone up to an eight or a nine. So, you know, it is a book that I think really invites um, deep thought. And one of the main criticisms of the book is that not much happens in it. Um, you, there's, there's not much in terms of plot. There's no great adventure. There's no sort of um, big twists or reveals or anything like that. Really, it is a a kind of documenting of the everyday, daily life, um, what it is to be um, a working mother with a very young child. I think, the, if I remember right, the child's two at the start of the book, three by the end. Um, the only thing that really does happen, I suppose, in terms of beginning, you know, progress throughout the book is um, she it begins with her moving into an apartment and ends with her moving out of it. And she also changes her name by the end of the book. So this book is literally the, the territory of light is, is this apartment, this light flooded apartment. Um, and actually it was great on the Heath because it was this incredibly light filled, sunny day um, after the, the awful storms we've had. So um, I think we, we shared that feeling of light and sort of overexposure in a way. Um, because not much happens in the book, um, the things that do happen, these kind of everyday moments, um, take on a peculiar significance. Um, so we actually began our discussion by talking about some of the moments that stuck in our head. Um, there's the first chapter, there's a kind of flood where the whole outside of the the, the roof terraces are flooded with water and then they come and paint it silver and it's like this silvery star. You know, it's quite a strong image. Um, there's another moment that I'll actually read out a bit around this later on in this webcast um, where she takes her daughter to the park and she kind of explodes at the daughter and pushes her away and then fears that she's lost her for a moment. Um, there's a moment when the dr they come across a drunk and they have to kind of heal him. So these encounters, I mean, and what, what struck us as making them feel so, I don't know, almost mythic, sort of hyper important, um, was they're often very strong images, um, very visual moments in, in this book. And the other thing that really happens in this book are dreams. You know, I, th I did count. I've, I've lost my written it down. I think there's sort of a dream every other chapter, more or less, and it's um it's really recounted in quite a lot of detail. You know, they're given a, up to a page or so, um, and the dreams are also quite strange, quite surreal, very strong images. There was one that I read out about um, standing in in the sand and hearing the voices of children buried in the sand, you know, really strange, disturbing images. So what you kind of get in this book is, you know, you can see it's quite a slim book. These 12 
stories where not much happens except for these strong images, you know, these, these vital moments and these sort of weird dreams. And I think taken together, it creates this quite intense world. And that world is the world of the narrator and her daughter is in it as well. And there's often a tension there between how she wants to have, you know, a kind of private world on her own and it's, it's sort of too much with the daughter in there as well. In fact, an, a moment that stuck with us was she describes a Sunday morning, this complete exhaustion, wanting to just go back to sleep and knowing that her child was wreaking complete havoc in the flat, but still not being able to kind of open her eyes. You just wanting that moment to herself, wanting some separation and that being so hard to come by. Um, but also there's this kind of beauty in this intense world that they share. And we do see other characters in the book. It's not just um, the mother and daughter. Whenever one of these other characters tries to kind of come in, you know, sometimes it's literally trying to come into their apartment or um, complaining about something or it's when she goes off to work. Her interactions with these other characters rarely goes smoothly or well. They're often portrayed as being quite aggressive, quite against her. And we really get this um, strong sense of how this woman, this single working mother, is seen by the outside world, by the other characters, by the other people in Tokyo at that time. And it's not particularly sympathetic. They're not, they're rarely, they're, they're one or two, but they're rarely sympathetic towards her. And I think this makes quite a nice contrast, perhaps, with how we, the reader, see the narrator. Um, so how do we see her? Some of us, myself included, um, felt incredible empathy towards this woman. She's very much not a perfect mother. Um, there are moments where you know, she leaves her daughter at home in bed alone and goes out and gets really drunk. Um, there, there's the time which, yeah, I'm going to read this out in a second, um, where, you know, she, she lashes out and hits her daughter. Um, she's not a perfect mother. And actually some readers among us in the group felt really, you know, and understandably, I think, critical towards her. They thought, you know, why, how dare you be such an awful mother? How can you, how can you be bad such a mother? How can you be such a bad mother? This is so awful for your daughter. Um, Others of us felt a little bit more sympathetic and understood or, you know, felt some kind of empathy with with the difficult situation she was in and appreciated the honesty. And it feels like a very honest voice. There's, there's nothing really hidden here. Um, it was also made a bit more complicated by the cultural differences. We were lucky to have a Japanese member on the on our Zoom who did talk about some things that would have been culturally more normal, that we were, um, you know, a little uncomfortable with, like leaving, perhaps leaving the child alone in the in the flat wouldn't have been such a thing at Tokyo, or losing a child in a park wouldn't have felt so frightening because Tokyo is a sort of much safer place than, say, London. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to read out now this... Um, moment. So she takes her daughter to the park. Um, this is on page 26. It's in the chapter called Sunday in the Trees. Um, so they've, she's just taken her to the to the park and you know she's exhausted and this is the daughter speaking. Move this leg, move it. My daughter had her arms around my leg and was lifting it so that I had to grab the trunk of the nearest elm to keep my balance. Hey, let go of me. I said, let go. No, I'm going to smash up this leg. Oh yeah, you've bitten off more than you can chew, kid. As I spoke, I swiveled this way and that with her astride my leg. Then, 
but she still wouldn't let go. I peered down at her face. She glared back at me, pale with anger. There was no sign of childish tears or a conciliatory smile. Was she saying it was all my fault? The thought was barely formed before I had given her a swift slap on the cheek and was blurting, so take off then if you're so keen. Go on. You're not the only one who's fed up, you know. There's a limit to what I can stand. You've been carrying on all day. You're lonely. You're bored. Don't you ever stop to think about me? You made such a fuss about coming here and now I've brought you. So go on. Don't just stand there. Get going. I gave her a shove on the forehead. She retreated one step at a time, her mouth open, aghast. And when she backed into someone walking past, her face crumpled and she turned away from me and dashed off. She was out of sight in no time. Alone, I was suddenly conscious of the eyes of passers-by and hastily glanced back up into the elm branches. I felt vertigo. I wasn't sure what I'd done. I was afraid of my child. That fear, which I could still feel inside me, was all I knew. Here was I, a mother trying to take her child's father from her, a mother who, for no good reason, was pulling her child over to her own side at the father's expense. I heard his voice. So tell me, what makes you think you're a better parent than me? I had no answer. Daddy's right. I like him much better. I wish you'd take me to Daddy's place. Why were children the only ones who ever got to melt down? So it's quite a shocking moment, that slap and the shove away. Um, you get also the, the sudden moment of her suddenly seeing, she's conscious of the eyes of passers-by. She suddenly is aware that she's, she's not in a private world, she's being witnessed. Um, just to, for clarity's sake, um, I believe that at the time when, when a divorce was happening, so, okay, divorce was sort of really not an okay thing and the, um, there's no such thing as joint custody now. So it was sort of either you keep the child or you don't, that's sort of it. Um, and I think this thing of, you know, why can't she melt down occasionally? You know, I, I th we all feel that, right? We all have those moments when you're with a child and you just kind of lose it and it just feels too much. I think particularly that feeling of a child clinging onto your leg. Oh my God, it's just so claustrophobic and annoying. But yet it does feel, you know, like a step too far, this, this slap, this shove away. Um, it's a really uncomfortable scene and a really powerful one. And what struck me in it as being, you know, quite unexpected was when she says, I was afraid of my child. I was really not expecting that emotion, that fear to come out. Um, and we had quite a good talk about what, what she might be frightened of. And actually this fear comes up as an underlying emotion time and again throughout the book. Often it's as um, a fear of death. Um, and... I'm just going to read out one other bit very quickly, which is this chapter called Flames. It's all about death. Death's kind of waiting for her around every turn. And um, all these, she keeps coming across funerals as a suicide. And right at the end, I'm just going to read out the final thing. She witnesses this explosion of a chemical factory. She says, I had the feeling that I finally understood what the series of deaths have been trying to tell me. The light of heat, of energy... My body was fully endowed with heat and energy. I couldn't help but see myself standing there last night, transfixed by the glowing red sky, never sparing the approach of death of thought. So she kind of sees all these deaths and almost transcends it with this sort of light and heat and energy. Um, it's a really strange book. It's a really intense book. It's a very honest book. Um, I think it... Maybe it could have been pulled a little bit more together, but it remains for me a very powerful one um, that will really haunt me and has given me much to think about. Thank you very much.